So hello, uh, we will start with our second uh, lecture panel. So if I can ask people to slowly sit down and refocus. So it's my pleasure to welcome Maya and Robin folks uh, this afternoon with us. They came to spend their time here from London uh, where they uh, teach at the University College of London. Uh, Maya and Reuben are co-founders of the Translocal Institute for Contemporary Art, an independent research platform focusing on the art history of Central Europe and contemporary ecological practices. Uh, they also had the post-socialist art center packed at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University College of London and co-direct the Getty Foundation uh, supported by program confrontations. Uh, they are editors of multiple pu publications and books. You can find some of their books uh, back in our library. And now I give them the floor for the lecture, which will take approximately 45 minutes, and then there will be space for some questions and answers with the audience. So, welcome. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, hello. Can you, is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, Teresa, for the, uh, for the introduction. It's, gr it's uh, really wonderful to be here at this, uh, at this conference at Bozar. And uh, we're, going, we're going to be uh, talking to you today uh, about uh, uh, the cur doing a curatorial self-criticism. And when we say self-criticism, uh, what we mean is the Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist, Maoist practice of self-criticism, uh, doing something in that spirit, which was uh, about activists and uh, uh, artists and writers coming together in public to recognize their past feeling, their past failings and their deviations from the straight line of ideology. And um, th th these, these kinds of acts of self-criticism could be in the published press, could be in uh, party meetings or other kinds of public gatherings. And uh, they were very often a, uh, an act of ideological purification. They also took the form of a political ritual. And that from today's perspective, they could also be seen as you know, a note to self as well, as a kind of way of self-improving and reflecting on what, you're, on what you're doing and the changes. And there's also very much, self-criticism was also very much about uh, uh, the way, uh, ways of changing and modifying and shifting ideology in response to changing social and political conditions. So we, in other words, we're going to put ourselves uh, on, the, on the spot and we're going to talk about the, um, what happened during and after uh, the exhibitions that we curated uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and there were, we call it revolutionary trilogy, but there were three separate shows, which were traveling exhibitions, which we organized uh, at the anniversary, 50th anniversary of Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Then, uh, well, that was in 2006. Yes. Then in 2008, this was a traveling show during 2007. In 2008, we did the Revolution I Love You, uh, which, was an hour, which is a 40th anniversary of 1968. Oh. And then the year after, we did uh, uh, also an exhibition about 1989 which was called Revolutionary Decadence, and that was um, on the 20th anniversary of 1989. And since then, so much happened, uh, and we kind of wanted to share with you how we think, what, what we did wrong, um, and you know all the things that happened around, and we kind of feel we need to sh share our self-criticisms with you. And um, also, perhaps, when to say that we Translocal, Translocal Institute, uh, because we also translocal ourselves. Ruben is British, I'm Croatian. We lived in Hungary for over two decades. And uh, at the time where we curated this exhibition, it was very much we were based in Budapest. And two years ago, we moved uh, to UK. Um, that's because the university we were working at uh, in Budapest was uh, threatened with expulsion. And uh, also Brexit happened. So you kind of had to take, make some decisions. So we decided to move uh, to London. So the first show, 56, this was, as Ruben said, 2006, and uh, this was the time when we were told, you know, after 89, there is no more history, there is no need to think about revolutions anymore. And we 
perhaps thought, well, maybe we need to think about it again. And uh, we, we didn't know what it was, but we knew it wasn't a, it wasn't a garden party. Yeah, uh, we'll cut, well, maybe we'll come on to the quotes about the, the garden party and the title in, in a second, but, uh, or we could go straight to it. So, yes, so, the, you, you know, the, the, the title, a, re a Revolution is Not a Garden Party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery, it cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. And this is a quotation from uh, Mao Tse Tung. It's actually a little bit of an un unusual uh, quotation, but or very, there are two different ways of translating the uh, original Chinese title, so it's very often translated as revolution is not a dinner party, but we were kind of, we also came across this version of uh, revolution not a garden party, which we were uh, drawn to, and in a way the exhibition was a kind of reaction to this, because uh, we also wanted to think about the idea that, uh, that revolution doesn't have to be violent, so it doesn't have to be uh, a, 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 revolu a violent insurrection where one class overthrows another. We wanted to think about revolution as art, as embroidery, as uh, uh, a more creative uh, act. So it took place in Trafal Gallery in Budapest, and it was a group show with artists uh, that you can see listed here. And we're not going to talk so much about the works that were in the show. We're just briefly going to show you what was there. So maybe you can... So this was uh, Croatian artist Igor Grubic. Revolutionist Heritage was uh, his work specially uh, made for the, for the show. And uh, his starting point was that uh, he always wanted to have this Bocconi futurist sculpture. He always felt it was empty-handed and he wanted to give it a red flag, a revolutionary potential. So he added it to it. And uh, this was also part of his work. It's quite a, he did produce a lot of different and things. And just uh, this work in the, with the... the, with the um, well, it's about the, co the, the kind of co complicated, complex nature of revolutions and revolutionary histories, because here you have the, the kind of uh, the communist Soviet side and the black side, black colors, anarchism, communism, maybe and dangers of, of reaction and, and coming out of revolution. Someone already mentioned what happens a day after a revolution. So all the complexities around... Uh, revolutionary history. And also 1956 was obviously seen as uprising, the first <coughs> communist uprising against the Soviet rule. But at the same time, there, was also, there were also leftist participants in that revolution, which were asking for a more radical form of, uh, of socialism and communism. So there, this is kind of talking about these this issues. And he, this, is the, the, this is the answer to the panel this morning. So <laughs> we shattered the myth of apolitical art to pieces. Um, which so is a quote uh, of Mayakovsky that Igor Grubic put in the exhibition. So we... Oh, and just b behind, maybe just to mention, you can see these uh, 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 pictures behind, uh, which will also show another image that, which was used on the cover of the, of the uh, exhibition publication. And uh, they basically show his, uh, his, gr his uh, grandparents, his grandfather and grandmother with... Uh, 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 caps with red stars on as uh, teddy bears in bed. So he was also referring back to his own uh, personal histories and Yugoslav, particular Yugoslav histories of the partisan movement. And uh, you know, again, this contrast between the, the softness of the, of the teddy bears and the violence of those histories and how they're regarded today. Okay, then there was the exhibition, there was a work about, uh, you know, who are the future revolutionaries? This is, this is a song, traditional Irish song about you know, kind of uh, revolutionary feelings and nationalist feeling, and then the young boy playing computer games. And then there was a film about uh, three failures by Michael Bloom, he, who talked about the failure of communism, failure of capitalism, and the failure of social democracy as the failures of 20th century. And then there was a work by Albanian artist uh, Adrian Pace, who said this was not a performance. And we see the art artist circled himself there, uh, in the revolutionary uh, You can see actions. the boy over there. So, yeah, yeah, in uh, Albania. And then what happened when he moved to Italy, like many Albanians did kind of try to find a way out of Albania in the post-89 uh, years. And here he circled himself again in the uh, immigration office in Italy. 
and this is the story about you know the futures of revolutions as well. And here is a British artist, Neil Norman Library, Nor Neil's Norman Library to Civil Disobedience. So what 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 he did here for this uh, work is he he wanted to have this library to civil disobedience. So he co collected together a list of lots of uh, radical and revolutionary works. Uh, written works about uh, civil disobedience and self-organization and guerrilla tactics, uh, you know, and Che Guevara and so on. And uh, no, just uh, so this is. We also did the interviews with all the artists who were in the show, and this is the first moment of self-criticism. In the interview, we asked him, "Would you like to explore non-violence as a key principle in radical social change? How do you see the revolutions of the future?" And this is his answer. Yeah. He said. Uh, I see them operating on a micro level, radicalizing subjectivities one by one, a bit like radical Islam. Okay, so this was 2006. By like rereading that today, it was, was a bit I shocking that it's in, the, in our publication. I mean, it was shocking already then, and we were a little bit, uh, you know, outraged by these answers. It seemed very arrogant over already then, but then it was... We thought this is the artist uh, point of view, we're going to uh, print it, and obviously that happened way before all the wave of terrorist attacks that happened afterwards. And we just remember well, last time we were in Brussels, it was just about two weeks after the terrorist attack here. And the and airport it's was just, closed. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, in no way could be done today in the same way it was done then. Another thing, this is a book which was uh, actually in the library of civil disobedience. So th this is quite, I don't know if you know, it's quite a, a well-known book of a, talking about censorship of a book that is uh, famously banned in very many countries. I think even in uh, 2017, someone was actually prosecuted for possessing uh, this book, the Anarchist Cookbook, because it gives a lot of very practical instructions about things like how to make a bomb and all kinds of, you know, things about uh, various types of very strict ty types of resistance, how to resist the police and so on. And it was already written in the period of the 60s and 70s and banned by the authorities. And we had this uh, uh, book, was, we managed to source it. It, was it part wasn't of even the difficult, it was just online and it wasn't yeah. even the dark web, it was it just online. It wasn't the dark web, no, it was just, we, <laughs> bought, just, I, it just buy it. we bought it online. And uh, this book got stolen at the opening. So it's, impor <laughs> it, but it's important to say. Yeah, but this was the context, it was stolen it. So the exhibition was timed to be opening on the evening of 23rd of uh, uh, October when it was exact 50th anniversary of the revolution and there were huge protests on the streets of Budapest, real mini revolution uh, and pro protesters were reenacting some things that happened in 56 and they were really protesting against where it was going uh, with the, with the, with the you know, post-socialist government and transition. You, uh -huh. you start to play. Okay. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be. If so it may this or may not, we'll see. So yeah. it was real worried that someone went home and tried to do the this thing because uh, the, you know to make bombs and take part in this uh, uprisings on the street. And one thing that the protesters did. So there was this tank. We talked about tanks this morning already. So this was a Soviet tank from '56, which uh, was. Uh, in the museum in Budapest, and they took it on the streets for the like 50th anniversary to remember what happened, and then. And in, so, in order to get it onto the square, they obviously they had to put some petrol in it to get it on and off the ramps. And what happened was, an actual veteran from the 1956 revolution who knew how to drive the tank got into the tank and started literally driving the tank through crowds towards the police lines. And in a way, he was only stopped by the fact that he ran out of petrol because there was only a little bit of petrol in it. I mean, this guy was like in his 80s. It was a, an extraordinary moment of rebellion in, uh, in Budapest at a time when on, a, on an evening, on a day, which uh, there was uh, the whole, basically the, the authorities lost control of the city in 2006. Yeah. So there was an artist in our show, Hungarian artist, who was thinking, I want to do a project about the revolution of 56, and I want to apply for Venice Biennial, because in Hungary you can apply with the project to be selected to represent country. And he asked us to be his curators, and we agreed. So he suggested he would have uh, like 10 animation films which would re visit this uh, reenactment of revolution of 56 on the 50th anniversary, exactly what was happening on the street. So there was a jury, and they unanimously supported uh, the project. And uh, so it was selected within, as they said, 15 minutes. And uh, they then went the next morning, they went to the Ministry of Culture, 
and the Ministry of Culture decided actually it was not appropriate for the Hungarian pavilion, so they discovered that there was actually a technical error in the application, that there were actually two curators rather than one, and on that basis, they uh, cancelled the uh, this successful. Okay, and project. it was a huge, uh, you know, a scandal in the in the papers and in the media. But it kind of didn't leave hung leave lead out of Hungary. It wasn't it didn't break into world news. And uh, the you know the jury was summoned and they selected another project. As we were opening the exhibition of Chaba Nemes, um, it was about some months later. It was on the same day that the Hungary won Golden Lion uh, for the Venice Pavilion for the, with the new project. So it's kind of a very cynical situation. But this thing that really was chosen and then unchosen, uh, it was also is now part of the art history, so post-89. And it was really one of the first examples of um, censorship in post-89 Hungary. And as you can see in Petrovsky's book, on the unfilled democracy is mentioned as an example uh, as well. So just to leave that. <laughs> so another, th th this is not another example which like coming back at it sort of has a little bit of a, uh, uh, gives you a little bit of a strange feeling. This is Sanya Vekovic's work, Figure and Ground. And what she discovered was actually in the, uh, uh, the uh, September 2001, uh, issue of uh, the magazine The Face, a kind of fashion magazine, The Face, they actually did a, uh, a whole series about uh, terrorist fashion. So this actually came out. So September, September 11th happened, and the current issue which was out showed uh, models like this dressed as terrorists. There was like a, a, a sort of terrorist chic uh, special issue of the uh, of the magazine The Face, and uh, what Sanya Vekovic did is she paired those uh, fashion models of terrorism with uh, uh, actual real images of women partisans and rebels, uh, you know, uh, through through history, but especially in current conflicts. Okay, and you can see it was installed with the green and the red. It was Hungarian colours, but it was also the green that uh, Sanya Vekovic insisted on as a. Uh, green special meaningful color and uh, for her installation and then the exhibition traveled to Manchester Metropolitan University Gallery and there we had this red background which was uh, it had to be painted three times because it was always turned out pink. It just seems impossible to get a good revolutionary red in England I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, so this is how our exhibition looked in Manchester I'm sorry, I'm this is a bit too quick. And uh, we also, this is accompanied by a lot of seminars, discussions, and conferences. And in the center here is another famous sociologist from Central Europe, Romanian Hungarian, now dissident, uh, Gaspar. Tomas uh, Gaspar Ta Miklos. Yeah. yeah, so he was speaking as well. So this is the cover of the catalog, and uh, we had interviews with the artists. We invited some theorists on the revolutionary theory, Velasa Shitskeha Drowning, who spoke about transversal revolutions and, and so on. And actually, our text was about, um, um, it was really about ecology as the only revolution that is awaiting us now, real revolution. And we wrote about Bookchin, who, Mari Bookchin, who was the founder of social ecology, and he said, listen, Marxists, it's not about the impoverished working classes, it's about the planet that is impoverished. And he said that in 1968 already. So we thought we have to revisit this and ask, um, you know, well, how relevant is that uh, for the revolutionaries practices of more of in the 2000s? What we would say today from a distance of 10 years is that perhaps we can't really, because famously, Mario Bakchin, Bakchin say you cannot solve out the problem with the nature and the environment until you solve the problems in the societies, inequalities. And it seems like we cannot really wait to solve our social problems. We kind of have to work with at the both things at the same time nowadays because we're running out of time. Uh -huh. And we also, asked <laughs> we also asked different critics from Hungary to respond to the artworks in the show. And it's funny that every, other, every critic chose their own work of art. They wanted to, it's kind of separately, and th there were no overlaps. Everyone chose something to review and write about, so which was quite nice. Okay, and so the here, here we want to show you something. Uh, 
that happen as well. And now the point of here, there's a kind of an empty kind of plinth or, or a shelf. Yeah. So this is because there was the work in the exhibition with, which we commissioned from Hungarian artist duo Kis Warsaw, the only Hungarian representative Little Warsaw. Uh, in the show, and they were not happy with what they produced, and they just threw it, took it out of the exhibition before the opening. Uh, we threw them out as young curators. We said, "No way, uh, this is not acceptable. You out of the show." So. We had no work by Hungarian artists, and they wanted to do exhibition, or they wanted to produce a new work, which was about what happened in the Hungarian government, uh, Hungarian Academy in 1989, when the young students kind of made a revolutionary uprising in the gallery and wanted to like overthrow their professors who were, you know, the old guard. So it was, a it was a really good, interesting idea, but basically it just made this front cover. There was hardly anything to it. So looking back at sort of self-criticism as curators, it seems a bit harsh that we didn't let them back into the show. But there's another interesting dimension that uh, uh, many years later, like in 2016. 2016, they finished the project. So like weirdly, they're, they're, that's kind of the way they work. They work very slowly with very few projects, but they actually carried on with the idea and produced this huge book and exhibition as well at the Off Biennale in Budapest, called Rebels, where they actually, in 2017, where they actually realized uh, this, the work which their was work. started in our show. And so they made us buy the copy, but they signed it for us. It, that's so we're friends again. And it was funny, footnote 11 is where they really <laughs> showed the history of the work, where they so, said... So 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 the study of the Academy Student Revolt began in 2006 by way of the exhibition The Revolution is Not a Garden Party, to which the curators, Mayan Ruben Falks, invited Little Warsaw. Okay, and then it doesn't, go, it doesn't say really that we threw them out and so on, but <laughs> this, is the, this is what happened. But, uh, but maybe just, just to say, like, you know, talking about the difference between today and now and their work now, which they realize now, it's actually... Uh, and it was already mentioned this morning about the kind of myth or the kitsch of 89. You can see that they're very... Uh, what people didn't like is they were very critical uh, or they refused to mythologize or see a kind of heroic role for the art world in 89. They kind of were destroying people's reputations in the book. A lot of people were very upset and they were saying people just operating, uh, operating for their own self-interest and so on. And they were kind of criticizing the uh, kind of dream, the myth of 89. So the exhibition was traveling to two galleries in UK and one in Croatia, because we were doing the translocal very seriously at that time, all the countries that we have connections with. And uh, so when 68 came, um, it was uh, in 2008, 40th anniversary, we thought it was very relevant to, to really go into like what happened in 68. You know, why this was when the generation of the 68s, the our genera generation of our parents, in a way, and uh, and uh, our teachers, in a way, they they uh, they were participating in that. We really wanted to hear their stories, and so we decided to call the exhibition "Revolution: I Love You," which is from the slogan in Paris from May 68. And we thought it was about this kind of all kinds of things that are happening around 68. And there was this, uh, you know, all kinds of loves that were <laughs> that are part of that revolution. But it was incredibly important for us also to think about the 68, uh, not just in Prague in 68, not just in Yugoslavia in 68, not just in Paris or Chicago, but actually happening in, uh, I know, a as a first kind of global protest, modern global protest. And also they happened in the east and west of Europe, in the north and in the south. So this first exhibition took place actually in Greece, in Thessaloniki, in Center for Contemporary Art. And they're very um, revolutionary there as a, as a group of curators. They're all uh, quite... Com well, they are, yeah, they they are, are communists. communists. Yeah. And, uh, but they also, you know, you should not mention Macedonia, North Macedonia and so on, because they're also very nationalist as well. So it's kind of like <laughs> funny communisms. And so we did the revolution there. And we had uh, we had uh, more. Well, it was a, uh, a we had a mixture of works by artists who were from the new avant-garde generation, including actual works that were made at the time, like uh, Tomas Sentiobi's uh, Czechoslovak Radio, uh, 1968. Uh, so maybe there's one more image for that. Oh yeah. Uh, which which basically. Uh, 
uh, the, the, maybe it's important just to mention this. So this work was based on something that he, he made it in 1969, and he heard a story that after the Soviet intervention in 68, when they took over all the radio stations, the Soviets and the authorities, he heard that people, what they did in protest is they wrapped up bricks in newspapers and walked around the streets as if they were like listening to the radio, but they were actually listening to a brick. And as a conceptual artist, he found this like a really interesting gesture, so he created the Czechoslovak Radio 968 as an unlimited uh, multiple artwork with sulfur on the top as well. And this image is actually from the document uh, two, two editions ago, and when it was uh, positioned in the brain of the exhibition, it's one of the really important works for the 20th century, as curator put it. Okay, we, have, we had another work, but here is work is a disease, Karl Marx. Now, this is a work by Croatian artist Maldon Stelinovic, who was a neo avant artist, but he's also very famous for saying that East European artists are writing a manifesto about lazy art, saying that East European artists are the lazy artists because they... Um, Shall I read it? You can read some. Okay, so what well, he, he said, celebrating laziness, artists in the West are not lazy and therefore not artists, but producers of something. Their involvement with matters of no importance, such as production, promotion, gallery system, competition system, who is first, their preoccupation with objects, all that drives them away from laziness, away from art. So this is it's another proposition with the should, what art should do, and here is it should be lazy and it should be not working, because work is a disease. Now, uh, uh, Madan Stelina, which was very much involved in the, you know, Marxist discourse uh, at, in Yugoslav socialist uh, environment, and there was a, this very famous group of philosophers, Praxis group of philosophers who were based in Zagreb, and there was Marxist humanists, and, uh, and uh, really, they kind of made them, you know, they, they know your, their Marx backwards, but they couldn't find this quote. Because he wasn't sure, is it really, did Marx it really be say it? It would be dangerous to say Marx didn't say it if it turned out he did say it. So it kind of left things a bit in suspense. <laughs> so this, is, this was his intervention in Marx. in Marx. And then this is another work by... Uh, Marko Lulic. And this is also thinking about uh, 68 and evolution of 68 as a sexual liberation. And, uh, you know, all kinds of things that were going on around that time, but also what kind of revolutions were going on, or what, you know, in, the, in any kind of struggles. And there's always this aspect of it as well. And socialists cannot exclude human pleasures from his program. And in his film, this woman, the revolutionary, is standing on the top of the housing block and shouting, but she's got no audience. Because in the 68, in the films and so on, she would always list, speak to someone. But it seems like in this post-89 moment, in, of transition, the audience have disappeared. And um, it also makes us think, you know, what does it mean today to talk about uh, 68 as a sexual liberation? And what does it mean with the Me Too movement as well? And how does that fit in? Because it seems a lot of the, the kind of 60s sexual liberation uh, kind of outlook is, is quite heteronormative and uh, kind of a male sort of perspective. So. Uh, Perhaps so. It's, it's at least a little bit more problematic, like looking back from a decade, like how this kind of work is received and thought about. So Oliver Ressler, Austrian artist, who is one of the main documenter, documentary make, documentary makers or so recording histories of the current uprisings, and especially in the last few years of environmental protests as well. At that time, he was very much involved with the. Genoa protests against the um, globalization yeah. and, the, and the working conditions. Yeah, and the, G the G8 protests. Yeah. This is the other part as well. Yeah. So this is back in, the, this is in Greece, and one Hungarian artist uh, did this temple, a revolutionary temple, and obviously it's uh, with the, uh, the new temple is with the oil barrels as it stands. And in, inside, he had lots of images uh, about rural protests. So he's someone coming from a, uh, the former Stalinvar or Stalin city in uh, Hungary. And uh, he, in, he wants to sort of derail things or go away from the idea of the worker, the proletariat, as being this main trope of revolution under uh, a communism, an official communist ideology. And he wanted to look to the peasant, to the peasant uprisings uh, through history back to the Middle Ages and, and try and reactivate this kind of rural rebellion. And then there were more works about 
pro protest. So um, here is another self, uh, well ex exposition of <laughs> our curatorial work. So this is a work by Hungarian artist Miklos Erhard, and uh, it is a translation of the Guy Debord Society of Spectacle. He is an artist, uh, couldn't get to the bottom of it in French, and decided to translate it in Hungarian. And that time, it was in the 90s, it was the only translation of Guy Debord in Hungarian. And before it was published, he had a solo show where he exhibited every single page of it in, this, in the gallery. And people were reading it, and it was kind of well known. And we thought this is a good work for 1968, and we invited him to come and uh, restage it in um, in in Greece. And uh, he, because the way communist press was uh, happening, not many publications were um, printed. So and it, it says was a thousand copies on the cover, but yeah. it probably made like 50 or something. And this was post-communist, but still the same habit. That, Habits died hard or something. There, there were no many, and he had only one. He said, "This is my artist copy. Be careful. Don't lose it." It's, don't prob it's probably this one here in the middle. Okay, and so it was a hugely visited opening, and uh, we told, uh, I mean, before the setting, we told the organizers in Greece, we, we should be sure that this copy doesn't get stolen. Find a way to keep it, and uh, they said, "Don't worry. We put the." Um, and a ma magnetic tag in the back, just like in the shop. So if anyone tries to take it out of the museum, the alarm will go off. Okay, so the alarm did go off uh, during the opening, and it was uh, a man in a very nice pink shirt, looking very... Um, <laughs> Bourgeois? Yeah, well, you would, you, you would call them, you used to call them, hit, uh, what you call them, uh, yappies or something yeah. at that time. And uh, so the, the alarm went off, and uh, he just disappeared back, then, and the copy was found in the to male toilet. So it was put back in the show, and uh, two days later, someone turned the page away. <laughs> and stole it. So it's, for us, we still don't understand the mystery. Why somebody in Thessaloniki would want to steal the Hungarian version of Guy Debord's uh, Society of the Spectacle? We don't know the answer to that question. If the person's in the audience, please put your hand <laughs> up and let us know why you did it. Okay, so. well, the artist then did another, you know, translation and so on for the exhibition in Budapest as he was traveling and he printed some more copies. Uh, this is on the common comments of uh, Society of Spectacle, Guy Debord, and he wasn't so angry with us. This is just, he found it hilarious. And so we were installing exhibition there. Most of the artists were there. And this we is just were a, like reading all of the rest. The Chaba Nemesh was in the show with his remake. There was a special the newspaper. Uh, yeah, Frappe. Just, uh, this yeah. is the. This is. I don't know if you had much experience of Greece, but Frappe. It seems to be a total. At least it was in 2008 when we were installing the exhibition. Like, do you want a frappe? A frappe? And I was like, they would go to the coffee shop and get these like very nice cold coffees, these frappes. And it was somehow it became a symbol of of the kind of atmosphere of uh, 2008 in that ex in that gallery where they had like really good resources. It was like they had perfect budget for everything. Every night there was a wonderful dinner, which but didn't start till different? 11 o'clock. What was very nice, uh, this was the first time we experienced that everyone was invited for dinner. So usually it's curators and directors and artists and so on. It's always like who is invited, who who is part of the dinner. But there, you know, technicians, electrician, people working at the door in the gallery, everyone was invited for dinner. And this is a really nice feeling that everyone is part of the community and everyone is important in the doing exhibitions. And a year later, they, didn't, they weren't even receiving their paychecks, the people working there. So then the So crisis first they didn't happened. have ta change money for changing light bulbs. And then after a year in Greece, uh, you know, 2008 was just before the financial crisis hit. After that, they were like, they're working without pay and so on. It was like totally golden age before everything changed. I can see all the happy faces there. Yeah. So exhibition traveled around and we also produced a catalog, which uh, we I, had. I, I, what, a, a fact I really like about this catalog is uh, it's in three languages. English, Hungarian, and Greek. And I would really like to know how many books there are which are English, Hungarian, and Greek. There probably are some, but uh, it's a funny fact about the book, which also uh, we uh, you know, mixed together uh, the artist's works and reflections on it, and also some uh, uh, very nice uh, commissioned texts by uh, theorists and uh, uh, art historians, and also people who remembered that period. Also, there's a... Um, uh, Reiko Gerlich, the uh, filmmaker, had a really, I think, absolutely unique account of his experience at the Prague uh, 
uh, School of uh, Film in uh, 1968, for example. So some, we had some really nice uh, uh, contributions to the, to the book. This oh, was yeah. our contribution. We just decided to do some <laughs> glossary this about This is really, it. really funny. I don't know if anyone gets it. 968 joke. Which is the best educated police? Polish. They always go to universities. So that's a re that's a re if you get that joke, then you're a real kind of uh, egghead for the history of 968 in Eastern Europe. Because, of course, it's, it refers to the events of March 1968 when the police went and uh, basically beat up loads of students and the kind of violence of, of, uh, of that... Uh, uh, mo historical moment in Poland. Okay, and this is just a side to 68 because we also curated an exhibition. Kind of, we stuck with the 68 for a bit longer. We did another exhibition, which was about, which was Loophole to Happiness, and uh, it was also going. It was also in Futura in Prague and in gallery in Bratislava, and it was. Uh, we really like the idea of workers in the factory doing something beautiful for themselves, which were obstructing the factory work to create something uh, which was uh, for their own need and for, for their own well-being, in a way. And this was described in a book in 72. And then we did a whole exhibition about this idea of, um, of Homer's, as it was called. Uh, so we come to 89. Yeah, the last chapter in the trilogy. So, as you can imagine, by that time we were quite exhausted <laughs> of the revolutionary um, theories and, uh, and works and thinking about it, but there was a gallery in Budapest, uh, actually a city gallery of Budapest uh, and the Museum of Hungarian, of, of, of Hungarian Art. It's the Kistel Museum, which is the, the museum and gallery of the city of Budapest. So, it was kind of important venue in in the city, and we decided to accept and do an exhibition about 89. This exhibition didn't travel, it was just done for there, and it was called uh, Revolutionary Decadence. And now, Revolutionary Decadence uh, is not a very appealing title, but uh, we kind of thought it was um, appropriate because uh, Hungarian Revolution of 89 wasn't really uh, at the biggest of the revolutions in Eastern Europe. It was a round well, table, it was a picnic. It, it was a round table which was actually in the shape of a triangle, uh, if you actually look at the photos. And uh, it, was, it was also, Hungarians never refer, refer to the revolution of 1989, but also always the Rensevartas, the system change, which is a much less kind of active, like from below grassroots uh, feeling. And uh, so when the 89 happened in Hungary and uh, it was also what we wanted to bring out, and with this title kind of has it, is uh, the aspect of the, of the revolutions of 89 when uh, it, the environmental aspect, because in many countries of Eastern Europe, uh, an, uh, environmental pollution in the 80s was so bad that uh, people felt they need to, to react to it, they need to get into, you know, protest, because uh, uh, Romanian rivers were practically black. There was dispute between Bulgaria and Romania on the toxicity of the air. There was air problems in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany. And in Hungary, they were getting together, protesting against the Gapchikov Dam. And in, this 80s, in the 80s, and this Danube Circle was a very important force of getting together and, uh, and protesting against the, the pollution. Uh, and also the system, so it built up. And obviously we know the, about Bratislava Naklas and other environmental aspects of 89, and this was really important moment. And we don't even need to mention the, you know, Chernobyl exploding and really the failures of the system were so apparent. And uh, in 89, in 1990, or when the, when the system finally collapsed, uh, the first exhibition in Hungary, which was hugely awaited, was called the Resource Kunst. It was first Western show to open in Mucharnok. And they, uh, it was about ecology. It was a German exhibition. And it looked like this. So you can see the images of the show. Sorry. It's mostly like this kind of installations with natural elements. And the Hungarian critics were a little bit upset about it. And they, they really reacted. This was the first issue of the art, official art magazine, which was called Muvazet before in the socialist system. In the first issue of post-socialism, just lost, it was called Uy Muvazet, new art. 
magazine, and uh, they said, what is this? We had goulash communism. What do we have now? Tomato soup. Where is the revolution? This is a revolutionary decadence. So they got very upset about the, the, the lack of uh, uh, political art in that exhibition. So we took the title. Uh, the subtitle needs translating because for some reason the museum didn't bother translating it on the wall, but it's a foreign artist in Budapest since 1989. So that was the, uh, the, the take we decided to take on 89. We're thinking, what, you know, what's the most important transformation or the thing that we wanted to reflect on, especially in a Budapest context and a Budapest city gallery. We wanted to think about the fact that uh, the society and the art world in Hungary had changed as a result of the processes of uh, the post-89 period, globalization, but also the you know, opening up of communication between different communities and the influ influx of people, of, a, uh, of new groups of people and the changing character of the city. In a way, uh, you know, what had been uh, a multinational uh, culture became multicultural in a more kind of profound sense. So we were interested in, in, the, in this transformation and in particular, what was the role of uh, non-Hungarian artists, or foreign artists in the Hungarian art scene. This seemed to be a really important thing for us, like how are curators and artists from, uh, who are not local, non-native, how are they integrated? Is it really becoming a truly cosmopolitan art scene? And so we wanted to, uh, look, you know, we decided to, uh, to invite just artists, foreign artists living in Budapest to uh, exhibit, but we, to talk about the criteria, so. So we did, we did a lot of research and uh, getting together about these issues of foreign artists. We were very strict about who was allowed to be invited. And they had to be really participating in the art scene, whether they're in the national associations represented by the galleries or have their own spaces, so really participating in the scene. So it's not the question that, and then we asked, this is the question, the basic question about migration. And, uh, and, you know, and the questions of who is allowed to be part of it and who isn't. So we did the, the exhibition in this uh, gallery, which also has a huge church space, which was never a church. They used it as a main gallery uh, space, exhibition space. And um, uh, this is funny because this is probably the only institution in Hungary where revolution of 89 didn't really happen. It's incredibly, incredibly bureaucratic and a communist institution. And the technicians were not paid at all. And, and the, the technician hadn't even been paid for the exhibition before this one. So they basically, they had to employ an external technician because the people who work there are so useless, they can't do anything, even though they've got several employed technicians. And this guy was like complaining to us that he hadn't been paid for the exhibition before, and yet he was the only person who could actually install anything. So, okay. it was so we had a lot of artists. One of them was uh, this British artist who was living in Hungary. He's a British artist who moved from Glasgow to Budapest, and uh, he was also making sausages because that was his way of survival, not from his art. And he did this sculpture, which he is also, also comes from a family of butchers. Yeah. Well, and his art, yeah. So this is him. Yeah. And we also asked the photographer to uh, photograph every artist for the catalog uh, in the space of the exhibition, so kind of inscribe them into this institution in a way. A uh, Brazilian artist uh, who did a lot of photographs in the cemetery and also feminist side to her. This is her, um, Claudia Martins. This uh, light was done by a Serbian artist, Katarina Shevic, and uh, she was very interested much uh, William interested. Also, she was interested in William Morris and this kind of, the way that, uh, you know, we talk about consumerism in, different in the East and the West, but actually uh, for a lot of public buildings, uh, craftspeople were, uh, commission to actually create lights. They were like individually created lights for public buildings. And she did a work in that spirit. This is her. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is oh, is why is it jumping? Is okay, this is a British artist, a Scottish <laughs> artist as well, um, uh, Dominic Hislop, who did the intervention in public space in Budapest. Obviously, McDonald's was a huge sign of uh, system change in Hungary, probably bigger than any others when my McDonald's finally came to Budapest and they had this uh, 80 meters turn and then he actually measured the real distances. That was his intervention. <laughs> so that's him. And then uh, next slide is by a German artist, um, Eike. Eike, who is who was an artist from East Germany who decided to move to Budapest after the system change. He couldn't imagine going to the West. 
and decided to go to another East European country and was working there uh, um, as one of us. He was so also really the founder of the Trafford Gallery, the first curator there. He was like really, really important, but in the end it got too much for him too, which we'll come so on So he, he had also slides about, and the personal ar archive exhibiting about his uh, it's years. It's the footage, that he's a video artist, so all his personal footage, he made it into this huge uh, installation. There he is. Uh, yes. Finnish artist, she didn't want her picture in. There's another Finnish artist because there is a lot of Finnish artists in Hungary because they believe they have a special connection. Because they share the word for horse stirrup. Uh, so there is not much <laughs> of understanding between <laughs> you, Ukraine, you, uh, fin, fin and the uh, Ugric tribes. But they it's just one word in common, but it's an important one. And so this is a Japanese artist. Um, Painter. Uh, Painter, yes, and then a Moldovan artist who also painted, painter who is also based in Budapest and actually managed to build his career, international career from Budapest, so from Moldova, yeah. And then a German artist, this was the only work um, which so was directly say, yeah. um, addressing the issue of what it means to be Hungarian because he was a political artist interested in political stuff and he did this kind of performance of. Uh, Throwing eggs at himself and kind of self-criticizing. I am not a Hungarian. He was like threw eggs at himself. So he was Public. reacting to nationalism in the environment. But also, this is maybe the moment just to say, like one of the principles of the exhibition is that we didn't ask these artists to comment on their position as foreigners in Budapest. We didn't ask them to sort of self uh, ethnographize their, their, their own position, their other, their outsider position. We just could come and show whatever you like. And it was about them. It was enough for it to be their presence. And this was something that kind of frustrated a lot of the local audience because they expected it for people to like doing exhibitions about how does it feel to integrate into Hungarian society and so on. But we all, the problems and so on. But we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to make them speak from that particular position, but just allow them to, uh, uh, to work in a, in a freer way as they wanted. Although maybe you could trace some indirect comments on the situation in their work as well. Yeah, this yeah. is him. This yeah. is him. German artist. Okay, and we also published the catalogue. Uh, that is, well, now we want to look. He is uh, not in Budapest anymore, okay? He's a uh, very international career, still That's based in Budapest. studio in Budapest. <laughs> yeah. He's still in Budapest. She's in London. She's in ah, Finland. He's in Germany. He's in Berlin. She's in Berlin. She's back in Brazil. He's in China. And we're also not there. And this is what happened to the multiculturalism in Hungary. And <laughs> this is kind of what how how epic fail of 89 in, <laughs> in Budapest, I would say. And, uh, and really, was, uh, it was, they were not the first to leave. Uh, first was the Hungarian artists who left. And the Trafo Gallery, in which we had all our shows, previous exhibitions, they, in about 2015 and 16, around that time, they lost one third of their audience because they moved to Berlin, mostly to Berlin, but to other places. And uh, it, was, it became more and more difficult to work in Hungary. And so people had to make their decisions. And this is, this is the fact. This is what happened to, to Hungary in, um, in, the, in the recent years. And in terms of self-criticism, when you look back at that, you can really feel also from the texts at the time that we wrote that uh, you know, we somehow we did believe in the possibilities of this you know, new global era, during the 2000s, it really did seem possible to live, every, live anywhere you like and to produce work and be part of this transnational community of people moving around. But that doesn't, it doesn't really seem to uh, work any, uh, anymore. And also, if you think, think in general about revolutions, and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was possible to look at the revolution of 68 and still find some connections and artists, younger artists are also responding to the uh, revolutionary potential of the new avant-garde, their radicalism and so on. Uh, but somehow that's harder to appreciate today. When the 68, uh, uh, the, late, the, la the last anniversary came up, it was just a whimper. No one really did any kind of serious reflection on 68 the last, uh, in uh, 2018. It was a total non-event, in, in uh, my opinion. And it's the same in a way, 89, we're also stuck with that problem. Somehow the failure of 89 stops us reaching back to the revolution of 68. We're kind of like, it's, we're, we're doubly blocked from that tradition at the moment. 
okay. But maybe we're not. Uh, I don't know, this is for debate. And, I, and someone said, you know, you need a generation to pass till you can revisit this, this historic periods. And I think that the new generations are being heard and are being um, uh, very much present and asking questions. And I think that is important to, to that's why 89 is, is now is the moment to ask questions. Now is the moment to reconsider. And I think that's why this, this such events are important because this is, this is uh, really an opportunity. Just like 89 was an incredible opportunity for the world to choose the right direction. And we know if we think about environmental side of it, the 92 uh, Rio summit was a huge getting together with the hopes that something could be done. I mean, if, a, if they had actually done something in 92, we wouldn't be in this position today that we're in, that the world is in. I mean, it's really tragic thinking about that. But there was this moment from 89 to 92 when it did seem like in terms of democratization of society, uh, of, uh, you know, being more open to other people from other countries, like a borderless world, all these things seem more possible, and especially thinking about the environment as well. It was taken seriously for the first time as a problem. And then again, we seem to have gone backwards since then. Yeah, but I think this is the time of confrontations, and this is the time to speak up and to really hear ourselves talking about these issues, and it's another moment when decisions should be made. And we just want to end with, uh, with l maybe a little bit more positive note, because we spoke a lot about Hungary. And uh, the latest news from Hungary is that Budapest has a new mayor, which is not the same, uh, you know, the same party that it was. Incredibly significant, because so after all these change. elections where it was always Fidesz in power, now the city mayor has changed, and it's now, uh, you know, it's no longer the, the same governing party, right-wing nationalist party in power, and that's going to really give potential and hope, hopefully, to uh, artists and curators and institutions and people and everybody living there, that actually it is possible to change something through elections, hopefully. So this is where we are now. Thank you. Um, what is the driving force behind what you're doing? Like, what makes you continue? And that would be like a tricky question. Do you think there is another revolution, like needed in order to, you know, because you mentioned that there are some decisions that are needed to, to, to be made, but do you think that a revolution would actually make these decisions come easier to like to, you know, into force like in, a, in a way? I mean, I mean uh, that's, uh, you know, it's a, Yes, a revolution, of course, revolution is necessary. We need some, you know, there, there is no time, as we know. There has to be a radical transformation of social structures, economic structures, in order for life to continue on the planet in a livable way. That's, uh, that's absolutely taken for granted, I think, or it's, it's sure. But what, what uh, you know, what form would that take? And what form could that also take in the art world is a question to, uh, to also think about. And uh, we, I think we were... Because there's a, this is organised by the there's a, there's a kind of Czech context here. It's also we were we were recently in um, uh, in in Prague, and you know if you think about what's happening in the Prague scene at the moment, there are a lot of very interesting uh, initiatives which maybe also point to something uh, quite positive in terms of uh, you know th thinking about the structures, the institutional structures of the art world in a in a in a much more critical way, like through this feminist art institution organization, which perhaps you know about, uh, or uh, also uh, thinking about climate change and art, you know, art institutions uh, really uh, mobilizing and trying to change the way they work in response to climate change and putting that at the center of their, uh, 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 their concerns, really. And I think it's one of the first the climate emergency thing that's happening uh, was about 80 institutions in Czech and Slovak Republic signed up documents declaring climate emergency mm -hmm. or uh, earlier this year. So it was February, February in this year, way before Tate and other declarations that happened. So there, there is, uh, I think that the revolution might be happening. We hope it's happening already in different parts of the world. And uh, it, we hope it's not too late, but it has to be, it has to be clear that people have to act and take. 
Thanks. Yeah, and maybe that's also, uh, you know, in terms of this conversation discussion we already uh, started earlier today around, you know, political art and, you know, whether artists should or shouldn't be political and if it's political, it's not art and so on. I mean, I, f I find it hard to imagine art today which is not actually taking into account uh, the climate crisis. What kind, you know, is there a non-political art today? I don't actually see any which, uh, uh, which necessarily be would count as art because how can you make art and not uh, and ignore what what value has any art uh, which is, which ignores or pretends that climate uh, chaos is not real so so are there any other questions thanks um, i might be the last one to realize but is there any link between the garden party reference and Václav Havel's theatre play Garden Party. I don't think Mao Zedong reacted to that, but <laughs> maybe it was vice versa. I actually thought you were the exhibition was called this way because of that theatre play, which was pre eighty nine. Yeah, so yeah. like it made sense to me. So I actually thought, is there a link? No. Okay. Okay. Thanks for no, the answer. No, no direct link because we just uh, our garden party was based on. The mouse, mouse. We went straight to the source, to Mao Zedong, <laughs> for this reference. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, if there are no questions, we would like to thank you, Maya Nerobin, for your input. <laughs> Thanks a lot.